Yo, 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 what's up everybody? How y'all doing? Y'all feeling good? Y'all feeling good? Wicked. Okay, so, um... Who turned off my mic? There we go. Back in the game. <laughs> So yeah, um, I'm just going to hit you with a, um, just a couple stats just to start off with. So right now, in the UK alone, there are around 2 million people who are visually impaired. By 2050, that number is going to increase to 4 million people. So why is this? Well, it's quite simple, really. Life expectancy is getting longer. And so obviously, our bodies go through wear and tear, right? And unfortunately, you can't really replace your eyes. So what does this mean for us? Well, it's quite simple. It means that the chances are greatly increased that you yourself are going to become visually impaired, or you're going to know somebody that's going to have a visual impairment. So where did this start for me? Well, um, I run a hip hop theater company, as you know. And we were creating a production where we were playing with the idea of taking the audience in sight away and bringing it back. Now, when we were doing this, we were dancing around really superficially, you know, just like, yeah, I've got my eyes closed, yeah, it's wicked, having a great time. Then one of my company members said to me, you do realize we can all become visually impaired at any point in our lives due to illness or injury, or literally some people just wake up the next morning and can't see, or even just by washing your face. So then it got me thinking, well, what if I was to wake up tomorrow, tomorrow and I couldn't see my baby girl again? You know? I wasn't emotionally prepared for that, if I'm honest. You know, even simply, what if I couldn't see a sunrise again? And I, like, I broke down in tears. I, I was a wreck. <laughs> Real talk, I, I was a wreck. Um, but I, I was like, well, I need to find out as much about this as I possibly could. So what I did was I ended up, I guess through fear, it was, it was fear really that motivated me to find out as much about this as I could. So through fear, I started to work with a number of visual impairment organizations and partially sight societies. And I asked them, you know, um, you know, why is it that a lot of people with visual impairment don't go to the theater? And one of the things they said was, well, we can't see the action. So I said to them, okay, so what do you guys need in order to be able to see the action? And they said, well, we need the movements to change in dynamic quite abruptly from like wide to narrow or high to low. So I was like, okay, well, b-boying, or as the commercial public know it as, breakdancing, but we're going to call it b-boying because we're cool up in here, right? That's right, wicked. So, you know, I was like, okay, well, b-boying does that. And then they said, well, obviously it depends on the type of visual impairment, but a lot of people with visual impairment see better when they look down towards the floor. Now, where does most b-boying happen? On the ground, that's right. So all of a sudden, there's a bit of an unlikely link happening here. But then it really took it to the next level when we um, worked with an internationally acclaimed poet called Kate O'Reilly. Now Kate, she sees the world in 2D. So everything's like a, like a flat uh, picture to Kate. But she said when she watched my company B-Boy live, she got an experience of what it's like to see in 3D. And she never had that with any other art form before. So all of a sudden, she got an idea of like a sense of depth and perception that she never, ever had before. So all of a sudden, we're like, wow, well, we could actually be onto something here where b-boying could potentially give people with visual impairment access in a way that they've never had access before. So that led to us being partnered with a, a neuroscientist who's based at York University. And we're going to be doing fMRI scans on people with visual impairment for when watch ballet, contemporary, and breaking. And what we're going to be doing is um, we're going to be seeing what are the most accessible movements within each art form. And what that, what's that's going to do is that's going to hopefully inform directors and choreographers on how to make their physical content more accessible to people with visual impairment. We're also going to be looking at the whole 2D and 3D phenomenon that Kate talked about. Because if that is actually the case for everybody who, who only sees in 2D, then we're going to be looking at, okay, what is it about b-boying that allows that to happen? And then we'll be able to extract that and then hopefully put that into accessible technologies. So, I also spoke to Kate about, um, like, do you know any, like, visually impaired breakers? And she thought it was going to be like when people say, oh, I don't know any um, visually impaired actors, and she provides 20. But then she said to me, like, Nathan, do you know what? 
I can't find a single one. And I'm a member of disability arts organizations across the world. Now, I myself, I've only ever come across two in my lifetime. So I was like, well, there seems to be a gap. So I was like, right, if there's no vision impaired breakers, I'm going to make some. But the reason for me to do that could not be just because I wanted people who can't see to dance in my show. So I needed a deeper rationale. I was like, well, what has, what has b-boying done for me? And I thought, well, actually, it's improved my spatial awareness. And obviously, it's allowed me to be able to get used to the floor and be comfortable with the floor and be able to fall in very safe ways. So then I decided to teach b-boying as a means of injury prevention and to improve spatial awareness. And within doing this, within like two sessions, we had kids upside down doing like handstands and doing like front somersaults into foam pits. In fact, you don't believe me? Check out the clip. Imran. Yo. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. Go back. So basically, in Rotherham, we've got um, a young people session that we teach here, where we teach young people with visual impairment how to break dance. And we teach that um, as a means of injury prevention and to improve spatial awareness and things, and basically just to boost their self-confidence. How difficult is it for someone who's visually impaired to dance? Well, for starters, they don't have any like visual references of like, you know, how to judge like, you know, the distance between like, you know, space and everything. So it can be quite tricky at first, but after a while, once they actually get to be a bit more connected with their bodies, they actually find it's actually a lot easier than, than you think it would be. Get an idea, yeah? So with those, with those kids, what ended up happening was a lot of them ended up um, becoming part of the mainstream breaking sessions that we ran. And a lot of the sighted kids didn't even realize that these kids had a visual impairment based on how they moved. So in terms of like social impact and social change, that was, that was massive. So we were like, okay, so based on this success, we want to take things to the next level. We want to move this to like a national level. So then we partnered with the Royal Opera House and Future Venture Fund. And what we did was we worked um, with a group of people who were visually impaired and we taught them at the Royal Opera House. Now, the ages for this group, the youngest person we worked with was in their late 20s, I think 28 or 29. The oldest person was 73 years old, right? So, and yep, they were all like top rocking and stuff and getting down to the floor and being like, oh, being fresh, you know what I'm saying? So, yeah, we had him upside down again doing handstands and it was, it was, it was great to see. So, you know, even the people that were in the 70s were doing this type of thing. And so, what was really great for, this, for us though with this was that, you know, a lot of them reported that they had actually used some of the techniques in their everyday life. So for example, if they've lost balance or if they actually like, you know, fell, they actually use some of these techniques to prevent injuries and to be able to fall in safe ways. So who would have thought that, you know, something that could be a, a fun activity and something that was created by a bunch of street urchins from back in the seventies could end up being a life skill to people with visual impairment and a valuable life skill at that. So yeah, that was that. So how else can hip hop enhance accessibility? Well, Doing our research, we spoke to a lot of people with visual impairment and they said that they feel that the current provision for audio description can be quite boring and unimaginative. Now, for those of you that don't know what audio description is, audio description is having somebody verbalize or basically describe the physical action that's happening for those that can't see. But a lot of audio description can be like, the dancer lifts the arm, moves it to the side, they turn the head. It can be quite dull and bland and whack. I'm not going to lie, you know? Um, but that's not to say that, you know, there, there aren't a lot of people that do enjoy it, because there are, you know? But there's also a lot of people that don't. So what we, what we did, as a direct response to that, my company, we reinvented audio description, utilizing the skills of beatboxes to give a richer soundscape to people with visual impairment. And how we did that was we utilized sound effects. So, for example, conventional audio description, it's linear. So you can... It takes a certain amount of words to describe one movement. Now, the problem with that is during a space of time, loads of other movements have happened. But with sound effects, you get an idea of speed, angle, and trajectory all in one, all, all in one sound. So all of a sudden, you can start to audio describe a complex array of movements in a very short space of time. So with doing this, we ended up um, creating our own language and, and notation system. 
And how we did that was we got people with visual impairment to physicalize each sound effect the beatboxer makes. So for example, if, um, if for example, this sound, if the majority of people said that, that they felt that that sound effect most fitted a, a, a jump, that would always be the sound effect we used to describe a jump. If the sound effect was the sound effect that they felt represented the spin best, if the majority of people that we um, worked with said that, then we would use that as uh, the sound effect for, for a spin. So we create a whole language and notation system, I guess a bit similar to like Laban notation or around, around this. And it took us six years to develop this, by the way. And during our research, we found that sound effects, some sound effects can enhance accessibility, but some sound effects can actually inhibit accessibility. So it's not just as simple as somebody being able to just to randomly assign sound effects and thinking, oh yeah, we're, we're making it more accessible. It's, it's, it's not that simple, or you really have to take it seriously and do your research with this. So the, the great thing about our methodology and what we've created is, if you have physical content, we can audio describe it. So for example, you know, we can audio describe like television, theater, film, advertising campaigns, uh, commercials, um, even live sport. You know, we can, we can audio describe anything really. So if any of you guys want to like reach new audiences, let us know, yeah? So here we have the rationale method of creativity. So we've, 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 we've talked about how we can enhance access for people with visual impairment, but what can we learn from visual impairment? You know, for example, us that supposedly have 2020 vision, what can we learn? Well, there's um, some glasses you can get from any like partially sighted society, um, which are called like sim specs. And these give you different experiences of different kinds of visual impairment. And normally they're used to, um, you know, uh, for people, normally people use them to do day to day tasks and just to get an experience of what it's like. But the problem with using these is, um, a lot of people walk away and their response is, oh my God, it must be really bad to not have your sight. Oh, how can people live like this? And, you know, people really have that kind of perspective of like, oh, all, you know, visual impairment must be just doom and gloom. Whereas like, we know for a fact that a lot of people with visual impairment don't want to be viewed like that. They don't want to be seen as people to be pitied. So what we did was we decided, okay, well, let's, let's flip the script. So what we did was we utilized each different type of vision as a unique creative starting point for making art. And the reason we did this is because, you know, as creators, as, inno as innovators, we all make work from a 2020 visual perspective. And the problem with doing this is you miss out on so much information. I mean, even in this room right now, there's so much information that we're missing out on because our attention is not drawn to it. So through altering the different types of vision, you can then focus on things you normally wouldn't focus on but you can also tap in emotionally to yourself and connect with yourself more so. And that way you can actually open up more possibilities for innovation and creativity because you'll be thinking much more differently to how you would normally think. So we were out in, um, in South Africa uh, just last, last year really. And again, we were upskilling a lot of the countries like top, ta top dancers with this, but it's fully comprehensive. Like it works for like dancers, it works for training in tension with actors, it works for painters, for writers. I was, I've even like enhanced businesses' productivity using the glasses based on people's different visual styles. So yeah, it really is a, a fully comprehensive um, phenomenon. So how can this help change an economy? Well, like I said before at the beginning, right now in the UK there are two million people who are visually impaired, and that number is going to grow to four million by 2050. So if your product or service is not accessible, i.e. if people with vision have no way of knowing about your product, that's two million consumers you're potentially missing out on. You know, and even if your product or, or service, for example, has just like, you know, you were to sell it to one pound for, to each of these people, then that's what, two million pounds that, you know, of uh, revenue that you guys are missing out on. So imagine if all businesses and all organizations, you know, Made their, made their products and services. And not just that, but also their promotion and their marketing campaigns, if they made it fully accessible. You know, so people talk about you know, wanting to tap into new audiences and stuff and wanting to you know, grow in terms of revenue and things like that. There's an audience already ready and waiting, but a, a lot of businesses aren't, aren't accessing them. 
and they're missing the trick. I mean, when I was out in South Africa, I ended up attending like a United Nations meeting. And I was talking to like politicians and like policy makers about how we could possibly like um, incorporate the rationale method into, into their strategy in terms of how they could help enhance an economy. Because obviously the, the rates of people that are visually impaired in South Africa are, you know, astronomical. So yeah, that's how we could like hopefully change an economy. You know, if we just get a little bit more creative about it. So I'm running out of time now, but I'd, I'd, I'd just like to finish on. I come across all this work. Why? Because I dared to basically be curious to take a genuine interest in something I was genuinely afraid of. You know, through actually facing my fear, I've actually found my life's work. You know, I've pioneered research that's not been done anywhere else in the world before. And that's just because I decided to take a genuine interest in something that I was afraid of. And I can say this with my hand on my heart, that actually learning more about visual impairment has actually made me a better human being. And we can all learn a lot from people with visual impairment. Thank you. Peace. <laughs>